All right. It's live from my website. Uh, as you can all probably tell, this is going to be covering nudibranches, which I'll explain later, and carnivorous plants. And not and just Venus flytrap, everybody knows you fall in, it eats you. Great, wonderful. Meh. It's more than just that, though. There's a lot of variety out there, and I'm going to be checking it out. However, this one isn't prepared. This is more of a research one. I'll be looking at some stuff. Anyone can follow along. Anyone more skilled or perhaps more qualified can also follow along. First off, I'll show off some stuff. Got some videos too, I'll just look at quickly. You know, some fun news. Everyone can watch it with me. This is my website. This is Tomatrovis, obviously. But this is the official website. Again, link in the description. I have plenty of articles up here. And the most recent ones go through history, they go through science. We have flame judges. We have the glue balls here, 118 suns, a black dinner. Uh, a famous Lars, so a famous person with the name Lars, if you can even remember anymore. And some more similar topics. On the website, you can go through different sections. A, it has, of course, a history and a science section. You can find the articles, their summaries, you can have links to go to them. There's also a donate section right over here. If you want, you can make a donation for one time, monthly, yearly. Uh, this is the membership part, but for right now, it effectively is the same thing as making a donation, except monthly. I also have this Redbubble account here, and I have all the photographs that well, are frankly good enough. I have way more photos than this, obviously. But these are the ones that I think are at least good enough to go on to uh, be bought by anybody, viewed really or to be put on merchandise. And there is plenty of merchandise where those come from, and that's not it. There we go. You can see here, this is just a, a field of stickers right here. Why not stickers? It's supposed to be multiple things. Field front here. Weird. Okay, these are all stickers, but it's more than that. Scale on down. There we go. Not a lot of different things. There's plenty of portraits. There's shirts occasionally, if it uh, works with the shirt. I don't have as many of those, but they're available too. Yeah, well, these, these are all stickers. That should be a variety here.
here we go. You get lots of different print art. You can get some of the posters, which are usually cheaper. You can get the framed ones, if you are so inclined to enjoy a framed photograph. And there's more categories up here. You can find, for example, masks, obviously, now. Uh, different phone cases, laptop cases, uh, coffee mugs, um, some different pieces of clothing, if they ever work, it really depends. And a few extra things. Coasters, as well. Why not coasters? Yeah, okay. But let's go away from here. I have two things to go through first. I'm just going to watch these videos. Everyone can watch along. And it, there's some things that have been in the news recently. One is, well, I'd say mixed, probably, because people have different reactions. The other one's the political one, which uh, I don't know how far it'll really go, but at least we can take a look at it and see what's happening. And I'll make that quiet. Thank you, shush. Here's the first one. Now, this one has the House of Representatives voted to repeal the 2002 Iraq War Powers, which, if you're not clear, essentially it gives America a reason or ability to go and invade Iraq. But when you reauthorize this and reuse this continually, it also gives you the ability to kind of do other stuff. And it, I've heard it that it gets used as justification for being able to go to different places and different conflicts, just kind of put troops here or there. Not only troops, it's always it's always uh, special forces, or maybe advisors here and there. However, they voted to get rid of this, just the House, though. I haven't seen any follow-up, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I love it. The comments are amazing. Does that include the Patriot Act, too? <laughs> It would be nice, but here they voted on this. The yeas are 268, and the nays are 161. And that is way too quiet. One, the bill is passed. Okay, their volume is atrocious. I'm going to check this out here. Oh, interesting. Down here they said they voted largely, largely on party lines. Just one person was a... I mean, but pretty much all the Democrats are yes. Republicans kind of split. A bunch of them just said no. This is one of those uh, good examples where plenty of them are fine with getting rid of it. They don't want it. Plenty of them just say no because they just say no. It would be interesting if it actually led to anything. However, uh, America hasn't really declared wars for... I don't know, 60 or 70 years at this point? Wait a minute. Ex-government chief confirms U.S. Consider oh my god, okay. I don't know why that video comes up. Uh, we haven't declared war in a long time. I mean, Korea and Vietnam are technically not wars because there was no war declared. The last one was World War II. So the U.S. has weird ways of going into war and leaving wars. It's very strange. Even if you get rid of this, I really doubt it would change much. And, remember, it's legislation. You could just always pass new legislation. It's not that difficult. And of course, like 20 years late, what else? Yeah, yeah. Da, 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 da. Anything more interesting here? Yeah, they're, they're very, very, <laughs> the TSA. Ah, oh, I like this here. Yes. Volume. Control for your volume. Oh, make it so quiet. To, to put this contextually, I don't have good equipment, and I can be heard. They have no excuse. All right, that was the first one. Here's the next one. John McAfee found dead today in a prison cell in... I just want to say it's odd that Shepard Smith is a newscaster for just a normal news network. I can't shake it. Too much Fox News, but he just moves into the new networks. How do you do that? Oh, look at this. And there's Newcastle. Okay, well, let's get to the main part. Spain. 
The founder of the antivirus software that bears his name had just been ordered extradited to the United States on tax evasion charges. He faced up to 30 years in prison if convicted. He was 75, and a wild ride of a life it was. McAfee's virus scan software came out back in 1987, and he ran... So to give some context to this, uh, even if you really don't know who he was, he did a lot of different jobs. He was famous for the McAfee antivirus software that it would always pop up on people's computers. He was not uh, super happy about that later. He kind of didn't want to have to put up with it. He kept moving more and more libertarian, very, very far to the right. He was in Belize doing things. You can read about that. It's very strange. He claims he's innocent of most things, of course. He came back to the U.S., and then he... Then he was on a boat, and no, so here he is. Okay. Then he was on a boat. He was not going to pay taxes. And he was traveling around the world. He got arrested in Europe a few few times. He was in Spain here under arrest, and mainly because of the tax evasion thing. I mean, I don't know how you just sail around and you declare I'm not going to do anything. I don't think you should be able to do that. But he got away with it for a little bit at least. Uh, not that long. Ran the company for seven years until he resigned in 94. McAfee missed out on the $7.7 .7 billion that Intel spent to buy Ouch. the company, but he did amass an estimated $100 million fortune before the financial crisis crushed it back in 2008. In 2013, he created a profanity-laced video explaining how users could uninstall his own <laughs> yeah, software. That's right. The year before, McAfee faced criminal accusations while living in Belize. That would be the main part, which is a very weird story. I mean, just over here, you can see some of the summaries and stuff. You're seeing his videos, too, but there's a lot of extra stuff you can go into with him. It's uh, very odd. But now we'll go into something a little more positive. These guys for one minute. But we're going to get to the nude branches now. And if you don't know what that is, it has nothing to do with nudity. Unless you consider them nude, in which case, technically, sure. I've always seen them around, but I don't really know much about them, except for all the lovely pictures that, look at all these pictures, it's just amazing pictures. Look at that personality. Look at the poise, look at them. It's pristine and amazing. Ah, oh, fantastic. I'll go into the varieties too. See, these guys are amazing all on their own, but there are specialties, too. And, of course, there's a plushie, because why not have a plushie? Oh, there's a lot of plushies. Ooh. I have to buy some of these later. And, of course, there's a plushie for everything, so why not make a plushie for them? Ooh, interesting. Instructive pamphlets. Very nice. But I only know a little bit about them. As far as I know, they are sea slugs. That's about it. And what I'll be doing here, let's go through the information, check out some of the most uh, important stuff, at least. And I'm going to take notes in case I want to come back to anything later. And I'll make these nice and big so everybody can see them, too. I'll put you right here. There you go. Okay, let's start reading. All right, let's see. New to branch it. No. New to... Brent. Is it a brank? In a Hmm. They are soft body. Hmm, they're pretty soft body. It's a new skeleton. Skeleton. There's no skeleton. They are marine, obviously. Gastropod mollusks. 
I, you know, I, I probably should know the difference between these, but really, I, I'm not sure. The gastropods or gastropoda are all snails and slugs. Okay, so squishy little guys that move pretty slow, and they're all invertebrates. Gotcha. It's not spine. But they're lucky. With no spine, you have more uh, bendability. You can move yourself around more funly. Funly. Left, right, left, right. Okay, you have salt water, fresh water, and land, so they're pretty versatile. Just go everywhere. Let's see, we got sea snails. I keep hearing this. I get talked about as. Or maybe not sea snails, sea slugs is probably. Let's look, at, let me look at a few of these here. Of course, everyone knows the freshwater snails, but just these guys. They also include lipids. What the heck is it? Huh, it's a lipid, okay. Got land snails and just bleh, slug. Not much families. Da, da, da. They are univalves, a major part of the by the mollusca. So they are part of the phylum, but they derive from it, and there are probably other types of mollusks. Let's see. Huh. Okay. So the snails and the slugs are pretty similar to each other. It's just when you have a shell, you call it a snail, and when you don't, you call it a slug. I'm kind of concerned for the shellless snails, though, but oh well, that's how it is. Marine species also include abalone, conchins, mm -hmm. periwinkles, yeah, and whelks. Okay, anything with a shell. All the shell people. Various limpets. Okay, there's all the shells. Now, what is a mollusk? Okay, and we're in Invertebrates, they're part of the anthropods. Oh, these are lovely. Ooh, look at them. Ooh, not very well studied. But what are they, though? <laughs> I like the name Cuttlefish. Ooh, they're, oh, they're, oh, I'm sorry, they're neurologically advanced. They're beyond the other invertebrates, the lesser invertebrates. Okay, so they, what is it, who are they all included into? Okay, it, I, mean, I don't read this properly. The cephalopods are the advanced ones. It's a snail, yes, so don't confuse the snails with the octopus pie. Octopi, even if they're from the same phylum, yes, the same phylum of mollusca, they are the the cephalopod mollusks are highly neurologically advanced and beyond that of the simple snails and the slugs. Oh. Okay, here we go. It's a mantle of a cavity, dorsal body wall which covers the visceral. Yeah. Okay, they have a kind of skin. Uh, Regula radu, or radula? It's like a, it, ooh, a toothed chitinous ribbon used to scrape or cut food. Okay. But bivalves are not included and a nervous. So essentially anything with these weird tongues, a kind of squishy flesh in a nervous system, but no bones. Huh. Or I guess no spinal. Oh, do they have bones? I, I doubt they have bones. Okay. So they're pretty much just like the slugs. Oh, uh, where? What do they fall? What do they fall? They are an order within the superorder of Nudiplera. Man, this pronunciation is going to be horrible. The subterclass of Ringiplera. The infraclass of Youth. Euthenura, the subclass of Herobranchia, and the class of Gastropoda. They are, they are the gastropod mollusks. But essentially, all the, all the, pretty much similar to the snails and the slugs. Snails and the slugs are the mollusks. So let's put this here. They are. Oh, 
the mollusks, which go into gastropods. Okay. And, okay. They shed their shells after the larval stage. Okay. That's good. Okay. Got this good part already. Babies. And get shells. And when they grow up. Noted for their extraordinary colors and striking forms, and they get colorful nicknames to match the bold and brash style that they have. They're called Clown, Marigold, Splendid Dancer, Dragon, Sea Rep. They get so many good names, and other animals just get horrible names. Man, people love these guys way too much. Also, there's something I can point out here. You notice the two names here, and I don't know enough taxonomy to really be talking about this, the two names are meant to distinguish between different uh, species, but also between, I believe, different orders. For example, even when you have monkeys, and when people talk about monkeys and humans being similar, um, even if some, some of that is based on your DNA, for example, it's not similar in the names because they're very separated on an evolutionary tree. For example, uh, we would be Homo sapiens, that's our, it's the full name in Latin, however, and they would be very different because they're not like next to us. They're very far apart because they're so different. And even different primates such as chimpanzees, bonobos, uh, the orangutans, gorillas, they all have different names from each other because they're also separated along with all the lemurs and the uh, capuchin monkeys and all those guys. So they don't have to really be even the same. I think they don't have to be the same species. They can even be different species from each other. This is an order, and I don't know how many differences that means, but there can be lots of uh, subtle or distinct differences that make them uh, incompatible to breed with each other and to be just one large species that looks a little bit different. But i got to read more about this. Ah, there we go. There's 3,000 valid, valid, valid species of nudibranches. Ooh, a collage of nudibranch costumes in the Smithsonian. Ooh, fancy. Can look at that a second. It's a bit, this one's clutter here. Mollusks, mollusks, always mollusks. Lots and lots, 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 lots and lots of mollusks. Mollusks. Is there a picture of the radio? Ooh, there is a radio picture. Okay. Getting sidetracked here. Nope. All right. New branch comes from Latin nudus. If you couldn't figure that out, they're nude. And the ancient Greek, branchia, so gills. What about like the, oh, what's that, the, the lungs? Oh, what's that called? The bronchia, something about lungs in your vocal cord or your, I don't know. So they're naked gills. I think they have more than gills, but okay, they're just called naked gills. That's how tricky the naming is, because it's based on Latin and then Greek, which are not compatible with each other. They have different alphabets. They have different verb systems and pronunciations. The uh, Because I looked at so much history, I figured this out. I figured this out, I said. Oh, my God. It sounds so much better than what actually happened. I read it one time. Uh, ancient authors, would either, they would write in either Greek or or Latin, because a lot of them came from Rome, and once Rome took over the entirety of all Greek-speaking areas, uh, they had a lot of Greek writers, and there are lots of educational centers in Greece, and some of the best teachers and philosophers and a lot of other different types of professionals, they would come from Greece. So you had to sort of know the language, because it was the high, uh, the language of a higher class, more educated people, the more artistic one. And people really did love Greek. Once you learned it, they always said, ooh, it's amazing, I can know this language, I can say so many things. So it had a very old tradition, too. But the way they said this was, 
Latin was not difficult to learn. Once you learn the structure, it could be pretty much the same. Greek was a nightmare to try and learn because Greek wasn't just the simple uh, learn the nouns and verbs and the sentence structure and everything's okay. No. Different places would have different verbs and different structures for how they would speak Greek. And the Greeks themselves were divided because every region thought, my Greek is better than this Greek, and it's the good Greek, or it's the Greek people should be speaking in Greece. So because of that, it became very difficult to learn it. And once you learn Greek, that was just your entry point. Then you had to learn the other types of Greek and how the Greeks are different from the Greeks. And it becomes very, very confusing and frustrating after a while. Let's keep it on here. The branches are often casually called sea slugs. So yeah, I just get that name. I put sea slug up here. Oh, oh, I have sea snail. Okay. And again, slug because no shell, no shell, no snail. Put that down here. It's very important. There we go. Their family of apista branches, bronchus. I don't know. And then phylum, mollusca again, but many of them belong to several taxonomic, taxonomic, blah, God, taxonomic groups which are not closely related to nid branches. Wait. Oh, okay, I see. A number of these are sea slugs, such as the, ooh, photosynthetic sacoglosa. Oh my God. Okay, it's an interesting shape he has. And the, uh, oh my good, aglegide? That's like Japanese in the last part. What? these names the first part's not Japanese but if you say like G-Day that's closer to being Japanese or something they're often confused with new branches okay so they're called sea slugs just to make it easy to give them a name but they're actually different from other types of sea slugs so they're not always the same this photosynthetic one's interesting though well, we'll get to him later I'll uh, put those guys down here where are they where are they this would be a great uh, topic in the future. Mainly because animals are not supposed to be photosynthetic. That's a bacterial and uh, plant trick. They can just make food from nothingness. And they have to go find our food and eat it all the time. But I'll we'll keep those guys for later. Well, let's go up here. They occur. They occur in seas worldwide, so from the Arctic all the way to the Southern Ocean which is also the Antarctic Sea, essentially. Ooh, pretty much salt water. And <laughs> some of them can live in brackish water. But okay, so they're essentially salt water, which means you can't mix them with your freshwater fish. They will die. They want salty water. They live in pretty much everywhere, and the greatest diversity is the warm shallow reefs, although one was discovered at 2,500 meters. Ooh, interesting. The new crutches. They're benthic. I'm trying to. Oh, okay. Let's see. Huh, the benthic zone. Interesting. The other one is the new. new stonic? What the? How does that live in the fins? Ooh, they can glide. Oh, the glaucus. Oh, I see. This one I've seen a ton of times. This is a very popular one. Especially because, based on. I'm going to call them fins. Based. Okay, it's right down there, but I'm just I'm lazy looking at it right now. What they have the little fins that are shaped like fans. Uh, people like to compare those to fractal designs because they look so similar to fractals. So artistically, you see them get shared every single place. They're very very common to see. Hold on a second. Getting some text messages here. Don't need that message. Okay, now shush. All right. So you tend to see these guys everywhere, but for them to be different is a little interesting. So they're are they on top or on bottom? Huh. Oh, they float upside down just under the 
wait a minute, they float upside down just under the surface. So they're looking at everybody below. Okay? The what is this? The pelagic nudibranches, these guys, which swim in the water column, and then the Filurobucephalum. Oh wow, Bucephalum, huh? That's uh, that was Alexander Alexander the Great's horse. His name was uh, Bucephalus, or something close to that. Let's get you guys down. So mostly these guys here. In the pictures, you can see already here. Obviously, you can see this. These guys are crawlers. They just crawl over everything. But it's not like, like it's not accurate to just say crawl. They mostly they float, but they float over everything so close to the uh, surface that it looks like they're crawlers. So I'm just gonna call them crawlers to make this more simple. Hoverers, maybe if you want. Let's get the glaucus. Let's get the cephalo cephalopigi. Trematodes. Oh my. <sighs> Merging languages like this is so frustrating. Body forms are very greatly because they're apistobranches. Unlike most gastropods, they are apparently bilaterally symmetrical. Externally, not internally. Okay, so on both sides of their body, they look the same, but inside is a mess. I think there's secondary detorsion. Ooh. Okay. In all of them, there are ooh sexual openings. On the right side of the bot. Okay, that they do everything like that on their right. They have no mantle cavity, so they're lacking that part that uh, mollusks are supposed to have. Huh. That's interesting. Some of them have... Ooh, here we go. And this is why we do this reading ahead of time. Some of them have venomous appendages. Not poisonous appendages, venomous appendages. Just remember that difference. If it's venomous, when they try and sting you or bite you, they inject it into you. So some of them, I hope not, but some of them may be able to kill you if you touch them. Just remember... For some of these guys, it's look, no touch. Look, no touch. But it's not going to be difficult confusing one with the other. They're pretty distinct as they look here. Let's see. So it's called a serrata. There's the serrata. Oh, hands on their sides. Get rid of the predators. Many of them also have a simple gut mouth with a regular. Okay. The eyes are simple, and they can they can see if it's oh, they can see if it's light or dark. That's what they can see. They really can't get much more. Let's see, ooh, the National Geographic, that's good too. They're a quarter of a millimeter in diameter. They're puny. They have a lens and five photoreceptors. Oh, not bad then. They vary in size from four to 600 millimeters. Bit of a stretch. Yeah, but some of them can be 23 inches long. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they lose their shell and they metamorphize. Oh, okay, so then they're metamorphizers too. Huh. So they undergo metamorphosis. Like the beautiful underwater sea caterpillars that they are. Sorry, there's a phosis in there. Uh, yeah. Include you up here. There we go. Appropriate so that the Dorids breathe through a naked gill. Contrast on the back of the Aeolids in the clay cladobranchia. 
brightly colored sets of protruding organs called serrata are breath. So I assume they're just different types of neuter branches. Huh. Right, the cladobranchia are the ones that have serratas or maybe something else. But we're looking at a lot of different types. And you can keep seeing this. Like this has a different name, this has a different name. Now to this one, to this one, this one is a burgia, just like these guys. So there's a lot of different there's a lot of variety that we're looking at. You can't just think they're all the same, just different colors. They're not dogs, okay, and they're not cats. I'm going to also bet they cannot interbreed with each other. Certain species are just stuck that way. They're not uh, changing too much. They might have differences among the different members. I mean, people, dogs, and cats all look different from each other, but they're still a similar species. Or a similar, same species. Because you can have a lot of diversity within one species. They can all look very different from each other. But these are phenotypical expressions of your genotype or your genes. Your genes can be very, uh, they're all the same, slight differences, which creates a very diverse peacock-like expression, if you will, of physical differences. But it's just that. There are differences within your genes. It does not make your genes the same. You can't look at two and just think, oh, they're different. They must be completely different. It's not really how it works genetically. They also have cephalic heads, tentacles that are sensitive to touch, taste, and smell. Okay. And the gloved ones can detect, ooh. Okay, they can, doesn't detect odors just mean they can smell? I have no idea what this means. Okay, let's do the uh, anatomy portion. There are or oral tentacles. I don't know how to feel about that. If you're into that kind of stuff, they have oral tentacles. Uh, they have foot tentacles, which is the FT. Are these the foot tentacles? Or are they... That's not a good enough picture to distinguish between types of tentacles. They have a... Where's their eye? Oh my god. Okay, these things are eyes. They're puny. Uh, let's see, they have rhinophores. Oh, okay, I was probably mixing these up then. Okay, the rhinophores over here let them smell. They're, they smell out the top of their neck, essentially. And the serrata over here, these cute little things will inject you. Inject you? Hmm, that's not correct. They also have kinido sex. This C N I D O C I D O C N I D O S. That is a word. It's I know it's from Greek. I've seen that name in Greek places. It has to be. Ooh, interesting. Okay, this is fantastic. They not only have venomous appendages, which are the little tentacles. They also have stinging tentacles. So if you grab them, they will inject you with venom and sting you at the same time. Might just pee on you too, I don't know. Can they pee? That's a question. Of course, evolution, they lost their shells, and they, yes, they developed alternative defense mechanisms. So instead of defense, they went offense. Okay, their textures and colors are supposed to mimic the surrounding Cecile, oh, Cecile's invertebrate animals. Oh, wait. <laughs> supposed to look like... They're supposed to look like coral and sponges because that's what they want to eat. And they're camouflaging themselves, although I'm not sure how all their camouflage works. Maybe the animals can distinguish them. Other ones have intensely bright and colorful patterns to make them conspicuous in the surroundings. And poisonous tree frogs do the same thing. Those, those cute little frogs you see in nature documentaries that everybody knows are poisonous... It is the same exact uh, principle here. They're meant to look very, very unique and special because they're meant to be very dangerous. And animals are supposed to pick up on that and just say no. Say no to them. No, 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 no. I'm not going to touch that. At least they're supposed to be doing that. Commonly... Uh, just as soon as I spoke about it, 
Aphosomatism is the advertising by an animal to potential predators that is not worth attacking or eating. The unprofit, doing profitability calculations. No, in marine ecosystems here. Ooh, there we go. It's contest. I like the contestant. Contestant. I like it being contested. Most species. Species are nocturnal, cryptic, bright colors are roughly attenuated as a function of water depth. Mm. This one is the largest of the sea slugs. Chemically defended. Nocturnal is no, no, no. Mm. So it's nocturnal and you can't see it. It does not have mimics, which might mean that it's for something else. It's not meant to be advertising. Hmm. Well, they're gonna fight about this definition then. Nemo, the new branches that feed on hydrozoids store the hydrozoid nematocysts in the dorsal body wall of the cerata. So are they stingers or the venomous? It's probably the same thing in some cases. All right, so this is a, another thing some animals can do. If you eat or attack another type of uh, species, be it bacteria or animal, or in this case, very tiny animal, sometimes you can keep cells or the venom or poison that animal had, and then you can reuse it. Uh, it's not it's a super common, as you may know, unless you've done this before. But you can do this. It's not impossible. I'm not a hydra. Oh, these are the uh, those. Yeah, these are the. They have the big uh, tentacles in the place. Very small predatory animals. There, yes, they're related to jellyfish and the corals. Okay. Ooh, interesting. Oh my God. Ugh. Doesn't the the top of this thing alone looks freaky? Like a used medical bag. <laughs> oh, let's go back here. Let's see. <laughs> Stolen nematocysts. <laughs> Kleptokinetic. <laughs> they put theory in their name. Uh, let's see. They go through the stomach, don't hurt. Ah, oh, it's nice, it doesn't hurt them. Once in, they get assimilated by intestinal protuberances. Their intestines suck it up, basically. And then they get brought to the tentacles. So they go from the stomach to the intestines, whoop, straight out into the dorsal por portions. Is it the dorsal? It's the hind body, but the tentacles. They protect themselves. Yeah. Uh, they don't know how they protect them. And some cells of sp large vacuoles could play a role. And some can take in plant cells. And they use this part right here. They can take in plant cells to reuse them to make food. That's photosynthesis right there. And they're taking the algae from soft corals, so they're using the algae to photosynthesize for them in order to just get the food from it. Because it's easier to make food on your back than it is to actually go and find the food and eat it yourself. The group of Sacoglossin, that's why we saved that one, the photosynthetic one. The Sacoglossin sea slugs can feed on algae and retain just the chloroplasts for their own uh, photosynthetic use, which is called kleptoplasty, which sounds like some kind of plastic surgery. But let me keep that for later. I need to reread that and look at the second glass of ones. They use a variety of chemical defenses and protection. Oh, thank you. But they don't need to be lethal. There's a good part. Uh, they exist that mission. Evolved to be distasteful rather than toxic. So they don't kill you, they're just annoying. Some of the sponge eating ones concentrate their defenses. Huh. Yeah, this is more example of that theft thing that they were talking about. They're just taking any of the chemicals from the sponges and absorbing them <laughs> into themselves to then reuse them on their own predators. It's Hold on. They're preying on their prey. Wait a minute, I'm going to type this out. They prey on their prey to not be prey.
Mm. Okay, they're just eating and doing stuff with it. Protection is yeah. They really ooh, they release acid from their skin. Lovely. Guess you could teach me that trick. What is this? The proceedings of the malacological? I have no idea what. I need to know what that word means. What is malacological? It's a branch of invertebrate zoology which deals with the study of mollusks. In turn, huh? So if you like mollusks, you're a malacologist. How many of them can there... There's a society, so there has to be a lot of these people. I've never heard that before. Well, if you guys want to become experts ex, experts on mollusks, or you just want to tell people you are, call yourself a malacologist. I like the answer from the skin trick. Once the specimen is physically irritated or touched, it releases, oh my god, it releases mucus automatically. Ugh. Not only is it an, it's an acid, but it's also a mucusy acid. Ugh. I bet it's sticky too, and it sticks to you, and it gets the acid all over you because you can't wash it off. Hold on a sec, I'm putting that up here. Possess a mu... Yes. Mucosal acid. Ugh, God. Can you imagine that kind of stuff getting on you? Ugh. Ooh, they're making sound. Two species are, can emit sound audible to people. Okay, but it's from an 1884 study, and there's no subsequent literature in the scientific malacological community to back that up. Why is it being cited here? Like, they should be able to do more. Very elegant species. Hmm. They should produce a sound. The clink of steel wire on the side of a jar. Huh. Ding, ding. Interesting. <laughs> a watch once. So it's. The clock. Clicking. It's a clock clicking down. Longest and most repeated when they are lively. Okay, if they're happy, they make more sound. It's not from they're cold and without any motion. Oh. So if you make them depressed, they're not talking to you. They do. do not like the dark. Do not do not make clicks there. A distance of twelve feet, they're audible. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and you can see here the opinion people have. As long as an animal is pretty, they'll give it all these wonderful descriptions. But if they don't like it and it's ugly, they begin to have this weird approach to it. You can already see it in the way he's talking about it. The very elegant species of sea slugs. If these were the ugly slugs that people held, the big black ones, they wouldn't like it. They don't like all these different types of animals. But if they're pretty, all of a sudden, ugh, these wondrous marvels of elegant natural design. They'll start giving them all this description. The most delicate, defenseless, and beautiful gastropods that inhabit the deep. <sighs> there. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Why did I know that was coming? They're hermaphroditic. Which means they're bisexual. But in this case, literally. They're two sexes at the same time. And this is the key part. They're hermaphroditic, but they do not fertilize themselves. That would be ridiculous. They fertilize each other. I'm not exactly sure how. Well, there's a picture you guys can look at. Lovely. Maiden takes a few minutes. There's a dance. Okay, hold on. Aphrodites, they dance. They deposit their eggs with a gelatinous, or within gelatinous spiral. I'm glad they know that it's a spiral-shaped gelatinous pole. 
which is described as looking like a ribbon. Nice. The number can vary, just one or two, or two. Oh my god. They can have, this species has one or two eggs. This one can have 25 million eggs. Ooh, the eggs contain toxins from the sea sponges to deter predators. Wow. After hatching, they look almost identical, even though they're smaller, and they also have fewer uh, serrata or kirata. Their lifespan is from a few weeks to a year. Oh, that's sad. They live only live a few weeks to a year. So sad. Oh, here we go. They're laying eggs over here. Right, and if you didn't know, it, the orange thing is the uh, is a neuter branch. No, it's a ribbon. It's like a ribbonous kind of like a tube. It's an egg tube. And this is their mating behavior. Oh, get, get it, but that's uh, that's not PG. Uh, all of them are. Ooh, okay. They're all carnivorous. Specifically, they eat sponges. Height. That is actually wait. Hydroid. I like the name though. Uh, Bryozoans. What else do they eat? Ooh, they eat some sleeve slugs. Or their eggs. Mm. And notice, it's other sea slugs, not the same species. It does not make them carnivores. They just look a little bit like them. They're not the same species. And why? As soon as I said that, I read the word cannibal. Why? I cannot assume these things. I shouldn't be doing that. On some occasions, they are cannibals and prey on members of their own species. You guys. I was going to say you weren't cannibals. Ridiculous. Some of the hydroids. Smaller for this. Brazilians. Zoans, to be specific. <laughs> the Zoans. It's a One Piece reference. Let's see, let's see. Slugs. Let's see, slug eggs. They're also cannibalistic. Some eat. What is a tunicate? Some eat tunicates, which looks like a kind of. Is that a shell or not a shell? What is that thing? It's not a gastropod. Hmm. So they eat tunicates. Yeah, again, the new branches, they eat each other. Barnacles. You got barnacles, you get them. Get rid of all your barnacles. Tunicates. Barnacles and anemones. The anemone, anemone, anemone. anemone. The enemy of my anemone is my anemone. Hold on. The enemy of my enemy is my anemone. Enemy of my enemy is my anemone. I, the sad thing is that sentence actually does make sense. Enemy of my enemy is an, an enemy. God. Anyone can say that very fast. Ugh. Get to practicing. Oh, here's an interesting one. The surface flying nudibranch. We talked about this one. The Glaucus one. The very cool, thin one. I, okay, the, what is this name? They had, what are they called? It's up here. Ugh, these are different. They don't look the same. Alright, the, what are these things? I, mean, I guess they're technically kinodosex, but they're, they're more like feet, honestly. They're kind of like foot tent. Yeah, I would just say they're tentacles. It, tentacles makes everything easier. Just round it all off. It's a specialist predator of this siphonophores, like the Portuguese man of war. So just right, a type of a jelly, a kind of a jellyfish. Floating terror. Oh, it's a hydrozoan. Okay. Well, it's kind of the same thing, though. 
predatory mollusk sucks air into its stomach to keep it afloat and uses a muscular foot to cling to surface film. To find a small victim, it envelops it with its capacious mouth, but if it's larger, it nibbles off its fishing tentacles. <laughs> so basically, it'll find a way to eat you. Uh, okay, it goes after the it goes after the nematocysts, like we just talked about. It'll find the tentacles to eat them, so it can uh, get all the stinging uh, cells, and then it can use them to sting people itself. And it does not digest nematocysts. Yep, there we go. And it defends it, so it, yes, it is doing that in fact. I suppose you could, if there's a species out there, it could digest the nematocysts. I don't know if it wants to. But uh, this seems a much, a much, much better purpose than just digest, digesting everything. No. Let's get through there. No, wait a minute, what is this? I shut that. So hold on. A sea anemone. Oh, I've been doing this wrong. Wow, I got that, oh, I got that completely wrong. So the, the an anemone, an, huh? An, 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 an oh my goodness, anemone. I, I just remember uh, finding Nemo, anemone. That's what I remember. So there are sea versions, and there are these towering, flowering plants. Okay, let's just solve this. Anemone. Yeah, it is anemone. Anemone. Okay, there are an anemones. Anemones. And there are sea anemones. Anemone. 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 Alright. Okay, there are Doran and Aeolid ones. Also spelled Eolid. Dorids are branchial gill plumes which are clustered on the posterior. Oh, around the anus. Very nice. Fringes of the mantle do not contain any intestines. Okay. So these are the dorids. They have the pretty things here. And there's aeolids, which have the serreta on the back instead. They have no mantle. And some host zoo zooanthellae. There are dinoflagellates that live in symbiosis with some invertebrates. Okay. So the ones with all the, the serrata or curata on their back that flow all over the place, those are aeolids. The dorids are more like flatworms, but they have a little ploof. They have the plumes. So dorids are plumy, aeolids are tentacly. Dorids and aeolids. I'm just going to call it posterior. Okay, they're not really sure what to do with them, so they're kind of like trying to re... go back through what they called them, try to change some names, look at what they call them. They're not really certain. So they're in the order of Nudibranchia, which is located in this branch. Okay, so 
This is very confusing. Man, there's so many of them. So see here. There's sap suck <laughs> algae sap sucking sea slugs. Hold on, that is a that is a great name. Sap sucking sea slugs. What is what is that name? Secaglossia. Secaglossa and Secaglossin. So Secaglossa are sap sucking sea slugs. Swimming surreptitiously like Slowly's better here because it's, it's more tricky to say what the S is and the Y's. There we go. Tecaglossa or sap sucking sea slug swimming slyly. Ah, fun tongue twisters. Side, side gill slug, got bubble snails, got sea hares, got sap suckers. Ooh, the pleuro branches. Place the longer branches in the new pleura. And then they recognize. Oh, so a pistobranchia is not a valid clade. Well, I'm not getting into all this. Instead, the Nudiplera is an offshoot of the thin plate. Okay, this is just taxonomy stuff. This is going to be 12 nightmares and a headache. But for the sake of ease, I'm just, use, I'm just using these so I can see pretty pictures of uh, nudibranches. I'm not going to actually go through any of this because I don't want to. Do you, oh my god, look at all these. Okay. Now we're just going to look at the pretty sea slugs. Well, the Nudo brand sea slugs. But I should look at some of these tabs before these tabs try to kill me. Let's look at Nuraspidea, the side gill ones. Huh. Here's an example. Yeah, they're just going to keep breaking down, but I'm not going to go through all of them. So what is, huh, and this is great because this looks like a shell, actually, so it's really good for hiding, and this would be a good, uh, a good case of camouflage, or it's mimicry, and in lieu of an actual nickname there, I'll just give them smaller nicknames, I'll call them shell slugs. Head shield ones. This is Caledonora variants. Gosh, this is not bad. Well, look at him. Look at this. The purple brings out his colors so well. It makes him pop. Cadus. Okay. There are so many of these things. We cannot go through all of them. Look at all these families. Look at all this division between them. Look at this. We can do this for hours. Okay. Keep that for exploratory purposes. But for brevity, we are going to go through simple ones. It kind of reminds me of a razor, but I don't think that's a good enough name for them. I'm not sure what kind of name to give them, though. I do know is that purple pops. There we go. It's reminding me of one of the hammerhead sharks. I'll just call them purple hammerhead slug. And by the way, if you think these are just the simple ones, or there isn't much more to look at, there is a lot more to look at. Some of these guys are amazing in all of their uh, different shapes and sizes and colors. There. Go with your friend at the bottom. Ooh, 
Ooh, what's this one? They produce sulf They can produce sulfuric acid to attack you. That's how difficult they are. <laughs> yeah, sea squirts. Okay, these are they're funny enough. I cough them down here. This thing will spit acid at you, huh? Ooh, scary. Oh, check this out. Some nice gill art here. This is what I'm talking about. There, there's so much art inherent in their unique little shapes and sizes. And you can find so many different types of varieties. I'm not sure what to call him, though. He's going to have to go down here to the bottom. So for the sake of time, I can't go through all of these immediately. There's just too many of them. But let's go through some of the more interesting ones, because I definitely want to see what is being offered here. Here they have their nice little identification slide. I can at least check that out later. Let's see what this one is. I wish they can give this if they want, but they should also show what these actually are. But let's get some images here. We can check them out. Ooh, a fuchsia flatworm. You should look at that. Color. Wonder is this the new, this has to be the neuter branch, but I think this is part of it too. They look so different from each other. I think it's part of it. I'm not sure. Marcus, okay. huh. Marcus Aeolid Sea Slug, or, or affiliate. Let's see him. Ooh, nice and pretty. Yes, touch my pretty purple tendrils. Well, he'd work really well on the seafloor because he can always, the, the uh, serrata could always come up and they can look like just flowing purple, there's purple grass, purple grass on the seafloor, flowing with the, with the uh, tide back and forth. So that would be good camouflage for him too, unless he likes exploration, in which case it does not help him at all. There we go. This one's a purple nudibranch with orange serrata erupting from its back. It looks like a volcano. Oh, it's the Spanish shawl nudibranch. Okay. Now, there's some, there's some photography. This is amazing photography. Look at this. Look at him stand up. Oh, wow. Yeah, right. Going through them. Some more articles here. It's got some other ones I saved. There we go. I've seen this one a bunch of times. Nice. Kind of, kind of like darker green, but platinum green. It probably looks different in person. And these little... That's a dorsal one. So what are those? The, uh... Those are dorids. Yeah. The doors, their plumes on the back. There's a nice little plume, but it branches off a number of ways to resemble a plant. Same here with their little antenna top. It gives them a pretty distinct appearance. What else we got? Marcus ones. Fancy. Occasionally you come across the white ones too. I don't know if being white helps you on the seafloor. It might kind of stick out amongst all color. And you can see some themes repeating here. For example, this one right here. 
And this one repeats over and over. You see these guys everywhere. The, uh, where's the other blue one? This dark blue one with the yellow stripe, and this uh, sky blue one with a little dorsal plume here, those repeat, repeat, repeat plenty of times as well. And let's keep going. Who else can we see? The apolegma? Hmm. Here. Let's see. Ah! I'm decapitate them. So rude. <laughs> right? People describe them so differently. But this one, they went with the high fashion models of the ocean tits. But they have a style, you gotta admit. Oh, I just had a great idea. I just had an amazing idea. You need to draw a few hundred of them locked in some sort of combat or choreographed dance. That would be amazing. Alone, that would be a huge undertaking for an artist. There's so much to paint. Mm -mm. Not again, just type in new to branch plushie. You'll find plushies. Let's see that. So, okay, so these repeat a lot. Now, I'm not gonna go through every single one under the sun. Or, I'm sorry, under the sea. We're under, under the sea. And I should also mention this, their size, again, I, I said it earlier, four to six hundred millimeters. It means that they're not very big, at most 23 inches. So about, uh, how much would that be? Either the size of your nail, it's a very small coin, or maybe they could fit in your hand and kind of move around. But these guys are small. To get these photos, You'll need a much better camera, which also works underwater, of course. And I could probably go I could probably go through this for days and just look at them and list them off and off and off. I'm I think I'll be making a compilation one where I just show different ones. However, that'll take more time. So in the meantime, you guys can just check these out. Uh, let's see what's this here. Okay. Yeah, this is probably the best that we're going to get just by searching through the images. Now, there's some specialized ones I also found. I'll bring those to your attention, too. And you can see some of the most common ones. However, there are, I believe there's one up here which is not listed. Yes, it's not listed specifically. But let's pick some of the uh, biggest ones. And, of course, after a while, they just uh, oh, they devolve into colors. What's the yellow one? What's the red one? What's the green one? However, plenty of them are named specifically, and they look fantastic. So let's look at the new branches, opalescent ones. So I, I suppose it's just called an opalescent new branch, but I think that's just because they think it looks like an opal. I don't know if that's the name. Now here is, of course, one of the uh, most popular ones. It gets the name Blue Dragon. However, we saw that it was just called a Glaucus, and is it, that's its full name? Glaucus Atlanticus. If you can guess what that's from, Atlanticus. Let's see, yes, yeah, so they're pretty much all the same. Oh, I'm going after the Man of War. It's amazing. Yeah, uh, no person would ever touch a Man of War because how dangerous it is. But when it comes to these guys, they'll just go up and start nibbling on it. It's the most striking one I can find. Let's have a guess. There we go. Oh. I wonder what all these different... Because these are very different from the other versions. They, This is how you can also see how it's not the same species. It looks extremely different. It has no serrata on its back. It has no dorsal plumage around its posterior. Instead, it has... It's in a straight line, which the others weren't. It, a lot of them are flat or square, like, kind of like a uh, brick shaped. And it has all these little fins, these tentacles coming out from the fins, like little paddles. So you can tell just from this how different of a species it is. But let's save that one, because obviously it, it is one of the most popular 
and unique looking ones. And it's called the Blue Dragon. Oh, it's a red dragon. That is a red dragon. I just see two, so I don't know if there's actually more. And of course, of course there's Pokemon fan art of the Snooter branches. Oh, let's go to the next one. This is the bunny Snooter branch that everybody loves talking about. Because obviously, it looks like a bunny. It is white with all these little black dots and two, uh, I guess, antenna. I forgot they're just called tentacles. But they have like little black ears. They look exactly like little bunnies. And what is their name? Mm, there's no name on this. Name down here. Ugh. Can't know the species. Oh, there we go. Oh, so that is natural name. Joruna Parva. Call them the bunnies. <laughs> Yes, and it gets the name Sea Bunny. Again, very cool. Got him saved up. And they have a bunch of articles talking about this. People are going all crazy, like, ooh, look at the little Nuda brand. She's so fluffy, I want to hug him. Ah, I can eat this one. Not literally, I'm not going to eat a neuter branch. It's even white, it's even white, it looks fuzzy white, like cotton. It looks like sea cotton, that's how white it is. Wow. Right. And this one, of course, you'll figure out why, not this one, you'll figure out why the next one got its name. Where is... Should be up here somewhere. Oh, I don't have it yet. Okay. It's this one. This is the Pikachu in a branch. For obvious reasons. It's all the yellow, the ears, the black on top of the ears. It doesn't look too different from Pikachu. And this... <laughs> yeah, this is a very specific example. It reminds me of gummy bears, too, a lot. But it just all these different styles that they have, they're going to resemble so many different things because it's like plain artistic move with all the different colors and patterns you can draw with. So it's called Thessacera Pacifica. Guess where they're from. Litter of Pikachu everywhere. All right, any more types of new branches? And of course, there's there's so many we can go through. We haven't even gotten to this one yet. So they call this the sheep new branch, but look at this thing. It has what looks like either green, like green peacock-like feathers. It has these cute little eyes with the antenna that go out. He looks like an anime character. There's so much potential behind them. If you could figure out a way to make some kind of a, a attraction park around them, or some type of game, you could collect them as collectibles, get all the different Nuda branches. With the pure variety they have, there's a lot of potential here, as well as education about marine life. Just as much as uh, SpongeBob SquarePants was marketed towards children, and was used to help teach children about sea life. That's what the original creator wanted to do. You learn about different creatures that live in the sea. You could use them just as easily. Make a TV show about them. There's so many of them. Just give them character, give them traits and names and have them do stuff under the sea. It would be perfect for them. Absolutely perfect. Right, but that's probably enough 
for the neuter branches today. I don't want to go through this uh, forever. I am a bit stuck with these links, however. Let's. I have to. I have to read to actually find this now. Let's pull out some of the carnivorous plant stuff. There we go. Come out here. That's one. I don't think that the plants will go in just as deep, only because the. Uh, where is this? Uh, I don't want to learn about every single plant in every single way. Every single plant is different from each other. But we can at least get the broad strokes of what these different plants are. And I'll make a separate section here. The so neuter branches are coming down. And yes, I will make a different video about the neuter branches. I'll try to summarize things, make it a little bit easier to uh, see everything. Most likely it'll be a stream video too. Vorus plant. This is always tricky with English pronunciation. I say uh, carnivorous, but it's virus, which isn't vorus, which is very different in pronunciation. Right, let's get to it. There are plants that derive some or most of their nutrients from trapping and consuming animals or protozoans, typically insects or other anthropods. Yeah. And this is the key difference which makes them so weird. Plants are supposed to be the difference from heterotrophs. They are not supposed to eat things. Plants that do eat things are a bit odd. You're supposed to photosynthesize. You can make your own food. Why would you need to eat food if you can just make your own food? There's no reason for that. However, they do it. And they even say here, they can generate energy from photosynthesis. So I don't really know why they're eating things too. Oh, very interesting. They adapt to grow in places where the soil is thin or poor in nutrients, especially nitrogen. They can live in acidic bogs. So their environments are tough environments. And they're found everywhere except for Antarctica. Oh, but not the Pacific Islands either. Huh. So not, not very uh, Pacific oriented. Mm, so Charles Darwin called them insectivorous plants. Which is a great name for a band, insectivorous. Oh. Is that involved... Oh wow, they thought it uh, evolved independently nine different times in five orders of flowering plants. Let's see, oh, 583 species which do this. Thankfully not to people, because they would be dangerous. And it's three species a year, they keep finding more and more. There's all there's proto carnivorous plant species. Now, what are the proto carnivorous ones? Okay, so they have different trapping mechanisms. They fall into basic categories, and we can go through each category specifically. Let's see. All right, I'll put this one at the top. It's not covered first, but it's obvious. The Venus flytrap is extremely famous. Everybody knows it. It has two comb-like uh, appendages. I'm not sure what they're called. They look like leaves. Two comb-like leaves, which are open, and once a fly zips down and touches, it closes and eats them. And by doing this, you can gain energy from sucking out all of their liquefied flesh, which is what most of these do in one way or another. But we're also going to uh, see plenty of them, which are very different. Maybe you haven't heard of them. Maybe you know the word, but you never knew what it really meant. And they also have some strange names. For example, the first one here is another one, which is fairly famous. These are pitcher plants. And they work through pitfall. Yep, they trap it in a rolled leaf, which contains digestive enzymes or bacteria. The basic idea is that these pitchers hang out here, and at the very top, 
you can find some sweet syrup. So insects will climb onto it or fly onto it to drink out of the top. There's some dew up there you can see as well. The idea is that it's also sticky to be anywhere near it. So if they're touching the sticky part, or sorry, not sticky part, slippery. If they're touching the slippery part next to the syrup, they will slip down into the pitcher. And then in that bottom portion, there is a pool of acid, which will slowly dissolve them, and then it will go back into the plant, and they will fully digest the insects. However, it is also well known, and I've seen this before too. Oh, it's over here. They will also uh, opportunistically digest things. Small mice, little birds. They have no problem eating them too. And they can drown in the acid, which means more food for them. So quite literally, small animals can be eaten by plants. So you really got to be careful if you're an animal. It's not just what's moving around that'll eat you. There's a lot of other things that exist out there. These, we have flypaper traps with a sticky mucilage. Always mucus. It's always mucus. We're going to talk about those as well in a second. These guys are very famous. We have snap ones using the rapid leaf moment. This is thick, thick monesty or a size monesty. That's going to be the Venus fly traps, but let's see. Let's put these down here. I like the name here. Rapid leaf movement a jaw and it, it looks just like a jaw as well it's a jaw oh, it bites down some of them are that's the sticky mucilage is effectively a fly paper it sticks to the flies and eat them after let's get these out here a little more Are bladder traps which suck them in with a bladder to generate an internal vacuum. All right, there's bladder traps, and the name bladder is actually used in the species as well. This plant will have a name and be performing this by containing them in a place. And we also have the lap oh lobster pop traps or eel traps which force them. Ooh, yeah forces them to move to a digestive organ with inward pointing hairs. It's the same, it's the concept that once you go in, you can't go back out. You have to leave a different way which you came in because all the hairs keep pushing you and you can't go back into them because they stick into you. So you have to keep going forward and forward into acid, essentially. Stir. Can be active or passive depending on how you get them. The trifophyllum, it's a passive fly paper which secretes the mucilage with very mucus, the very mucusy things. The leaves do not grow or move in response at all. So this is the very, it's the passive approach. You can just have sticky stuff and the sticky stuff eats things. The sun, ah, here we go. The sundews are the active fly paper traps and their leaves undergo acid, acid growth. Oh, okay. And they expand their cells instead of dividing their cells to enable them to, what is this? The tent plant tentacles. The plant tentacles bend to then hug you, essentially, with stickiness. And those are the sundews over there. So let's go through some of these plants, at least. I'm not going to do this. It, that's way too much extra information. But we'll keep them down here. The protocarnivorous plants. I'm sure that they're probably similar in one way or another. Got pictures. This is the mucilage or mucilage. We've got thigmusty. There we go. Trifophyllum. It's a monotypic plant genus. Do -do -do, all over the place. Ooh, very African. It has short non-carnivorous non leaves 
which have a pair of grappling hooks. Wow. So what, how does it eat them? Okay, there's no explanation of carnivorous behavior. All right, it says they do this, but I'm not seeing them, so you know, they're just not included here. Right, but these were, there is it. these are the fly paper ones. So they're supposed to be very sticky. I guess they eat you like that, but it just like it's a slow dissolving in acid that way, but the leaves don't move. Whereas when you get the sundews over here, they call them Dros Drosera, is that a family, what is that? Oh, it's a genus, okay. Drosera is the genus, except the common name is a sundew, and these are the very famous one. So these guys have all of these red protrusions that stick out from the leaves. And at the tip of each one looks like a little ball which is very sticky. That's the mucus on it. And the flies and everything else will come down to feast on some of the syrup on them. And then all the little balls will start moving it. The leaves here actually move and they can bend. And the balls start sticking to you. And then more of them stick to you, more of them stick to you. And they push you together until you are hugged in a sea of mucus and you cannot move. And then they start uh, acidify, acidify? acidifying you. Just dump acid on you. Oh, too bad. Yes, and they're called sundews because it looked like dew on them. Oh, I've seen this a hundred times too. This is an example. You got a fly, which, which one is this? Yeah, we're going into different species here. You have a fly and you get rolled up. Like sushi. You get rolled up like sushi. Okay, so that example we got. <laughs> I love it. this is a book. It just scans a PDF to demonstrate something. Ooh, acid group too. Okay, let's go through some of the other cases though. We <laughs> got that one. Let's see the pitch plants. They have an internal chamber. Oh, okay, so plenty of uh, different species can do this. Hmm. So if you parry a stone, they secrete something to bring them all in. And they have an anthocyanin pigment. And this is the way that insects' eyes work. Uh, a lot of insects can see ultraviolet. And plants take advantage of this by attempting to have pigments which are visible to insects specifically to attract them. So this pigment, for example, can be used to attract them to it, but it's attracting them to a trap. It's a trap attraction. Covered in, yeah, there we go, waxy flakes, which are very slippery, and then they fall in. Once inside, they are digested with the enzymes, or, oh, mutualistic species will break them down. Very nice. So they have friends that rip them apart. Oh my god. Water can be trapped, which makes a habit for other animals and plants. It, okay, that's very interesting. <laughs> Right, the uh, Helium Fora is one of the most popular ones. Oh, interesting. So they're in Roraima, which is a very big mountain complex, but it looks like a large, flat mountaintop. And it's very, very rainy there. So they needed to figure out, they can't get full of water because it defeats the purpose. So they have like holes where they can squirt the water back out. So 
anything else here. Oh, okay, we got proteases and phosphatases. I'll just rip them up. Oh my god. This one uses nectar, which is laced with conine? Conine, I don't know. It's also found in hemlock, which they use to intoxicate them and poison them. <laughs> okay, so some of them just straight up poison you, too. Wow. But there's also something called monkey cups. Ah, uh, this one here. Nepenthes Raja, which, guess where that's from again? This one catches small mammals and reptiles. You can eat different things. Oh my. Right, again, there's a whole bunch of them. I can go look through those later, but I'm not going to do that now. Ooh. And these are the flypaper trap ones. Let's see. Some of them. Right, here's another one for the butter warts here. Oh, so this is what short means. If you don't have a stock, you're very short, so it's sessility. You're sessile. This is a fungus, that's it. It has over a hundred species of active flypapers here. Ooh. Okay. So these guys are butterworts, and the way they work is that their leaves look okay, but in fact, and you can see it here, have a lot of mucus that they uh, excrete onto all these tiny little protrusions, and once you land, you're stuck, and you're just trapped onto it. Ugh. That's rough. Butterworts. And some of them have flowers, some of them don't. Okay, there's a lot of variety here. But those are the butterworts. Sticky leaves, and they will stick to you because they're sticky. Oh, interesting. This is another version of it. And these are like, uh, it's a dewy pine. So like long hands, which are very sticky. You know, a lot of these plants seem to live in hard, but it's always bogs, mountains. This one lives near deserts. They always live in the hardest places. Okay, but those guys, obviously, you have the snap traps. These are the Venus fly traps. Also, we have water wheels. I don't know as much about water wheels. How do they eat? So they have underwater snapping parts. And they're twisted to point open. And they have fine hairs, of course. When you get inside, they snap shut. It's so a 10 to 20 milliseconds. You do not have time. <laughs> it's extremely fast. So I, I guess it's these. I think it's these. And they snap shut to grab you. All right, we also got water wheels. And this is, of course, for a separate purpose as well. Venus flytraps aren't underwater. There's plenty of insects and little creatures underwater, too. You do not want to lose those opportunities. 
water wheels. Who else we got up here? Oh, and these are the bladder, ugh, bladder traps. And this is where you get bladder warts. A name which really does fit what they do. And they pump ions out of the interior. The water falls by osmosis, which generates a partial vacuum. Oh, yeah. They have small openings with hinged doors, which basically end long hair. So they push you through into this chamber. And once you're through, you're stuck. You're done. <laughs> and because of the vacuum, they literally suck you in because it's so it's more pressurized, and they can suck you in like this. Wow. Not a great place to be. Get our bladder warts with us. What's the next one we got? Oh, these are lobster pop traps. So it's easy to enter and you really can't get out because of the, okay, these are the inward pointing hairs. The other ones just have the hairs to kind of get you in. There we go. And these are corkscrew plants. And the corkscrew ones, you can enter through a tip. Let's see where it is. And you enter into a spiral uh, entrance. And because of the hairs, you have to keep moving to the stomach at the center region here. And that's where you're digested. Uh, these are the corkscrews. So many fun ways to trap and digest people. Alright, hands smoke corkscrew. There we go. And of course, plenty of different ways to do it. There's never just one plant. There's always multiple ones. Oh, wait, this is... Oh, here's something else. No, I'm going to go that one. Look at that, and some of them combine mechanisms. This one has flypaper and snap traps, which we discussed before is the passive and active nature of some of the carnivorous plants. Some of them just lie flat and you stick and die on them, or you stick to them and then they grab you very quickly. So you can combine different things too. And the nepenthe, okay, so the this this version of the nepenthes, the jambon, is a pitfall and a flypaper trap because the fluid is sticky, so you can stick to it and fall into it. Great. Oh, look at them all. They're all so creative and cute. Okay, we've got plenty more uh, proto-carnivorous ones, but I'll likely make a, a full video where I just go through the differences very simply. It'll be much shorter than this kind of stream, but this is good to explore and at least look at them for a little bit right now. All right, I'm going to collect these. And then I'm going to move on to my last topic for the day. And it's, it's all very casual and relaxed, so don't worry. If you need to use the bathroom or get a snack, I would do it now. Oh, I'll definitely do this later. <laughs>
part of the reason I'm interested in this is how uh, other people describe carnivorous plants, because some of these videos are just atrocious. They have awful, just terrible attempts at clickbaiting, or they don't give you different types, they give you like the same one over and over again, or they over-explain something. Like half the video is just a Venus flytrap. But there's so many ways to suck in and make you sticky and digest you with acid that it's really a disservice to just do that. And once again, for anyone interested, this is my website here. You can find it, Tomatrovius, Tomatrovius, very easy to find. You can see different articles for science or history, either one that you want. You can donate here to this page, and any amount's appreciated, but whatever you want, you can do. I also have these photographs for sale with lots of different products on this Redbubble page. All these links you can find in the description, and they're pretty easy to find. You guys... That was... Okay. This is the problem with research. Look at all these links. Look at this all. Look, look at this all. Look at all of this. Concentrate you guys down here. Let's look at the species. Let's look, at the look at this. See? They value my feedback. And these will be all the different types we can look at later on. But there's so much variety to go through. There's a seashell. It's an Aeo oh my what is this name? Aeolidioidea. Aeolidioidea. How many vowels do you need in one name? What is how many is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight nine vowels in one oh my god. How can you do that to a person? It's almost Hawaiian. Species here, interesting. <laughs> not <laughs> great, it's not secure. I do wonder how old some of these websites are. Is die of the world? What is that? Okay, I'm not using die of the world. Chemical ecology, that's very nice. There's a, there's a lot of research done on these little guys. And again, there's the Spanish dancer one. Some of them are very well studied, other ones less so. 
So it's a creation of some species. Yeah. yeah. There are these six snails. I do wonder if some of these are a little interesting too. I'm sure they have their own quirks and their unique types of approaches. Look at this guy. Look at it. Just have to be a little sea slug. I think. Yes, the Epistobranchia. Hmm. Probably seven. These ones go nowhere. Two. Oh my! It's the eternity of copying and pasting, and copying and pasting. I'll have to remember this stuff. Go back and forth, and go back and forth, and go back and forth, and hope they're almost done as soon as you finish. Two. It's all done. Close to done, close to done, close to done. Hydroids are not going to do. Okay, this looks about done. Where are we with the... Oh my god, there's a whole other new branch section. Right, let's get you guys too. Lessent ones, got the Spanish dancer. Of course, the Pikachu ones, keep that in mind. Oh, I have one. Yeah, it's too small, I'll see. Now at this point, I have so many, you could probably like, uh, make a greatest hits version, like a hundred of these guys, a hundred of the best sea slugs. Yeah, I might do that. Still debating what the best approach is. I could do one or the other. But it would be good to showcase a lot of them because then people could probably uh, pick their favorite one or look through a ton of them. Pikachu! Oh, I pretty much threw everything. Ugh. Calling it a sheep leaf neuter branch. I'll find it later. All right. Uh, 
And say goodbye to all of you guys. Pretty cool. All the tabs gone. Alright, this will preview what we're going to be doing next. Got everybody saved to. Oh, this is for later. I'll take a quick break here, we'll come back very soon. And again, look at my pretty, pretty palms. Look at my pretty palms.
All right, go to back now. So what you're looking at here is the Zengid Dynasty. Now the main reason that we're looking at this, it ties into the next part I'm going to do. And this is just some basic uh, online research stuff. I'm not going to be presenting anything here. So anyone's free to follow along. Or if it's not your kind of thing, always check out. Maybe come back later or something. But the idea here is I'm going to slowly research something and then I'll have something I can present later on, a writing, hopefully, where I can talk about this more at length. The basic concept is this. We're going to look at the Crusades. However, we're going to look at the Crusades holistically, so all the different things that are involved. And officially, I believe there's a eight or nine Crusades, except, aside from those, there's a lot of other ones a lot of which aren't named, a lot of which were directed other places. They include Spain and uh, Portugal, and, uh, let's see, Eastern Europe, Northern Europe, a lot of interesting places. They were directed internally as well. Christians got their own crusades against themselves too. However, when looking at this, at least the first crusade, that's the key part, okay? It's all this first crusade. You can't look at the First Crusade just as a bunch of Christians came to the Holy Land and took it over. Uh, one, there was a lot of soldiers at once, which helped them. Two, they had a lot of help from the Byzantines and the Venetians. And three, the entire world around them was broken. That was the key part. The Middle East was united under the Umayyads and the Abbasid Caliphate. Let me show these here. The Rashidun was the successor to Muhammad, then came the Umayyads, who were uh, from the Levant, a little bit different, then the Abbasids, and their capital was in Baghdad. See, this is all very united. It's a world together. It's the Middle East, it's the Arabian Peninsula, you got Northern Africa, you got Iran moving out into Central Asia. It's a whole big union of stuff. But the issue is, this is a pretty map for a year, maybe. And then after a while, it starts to fall apart. Right up here. They're relying on Persians here. See, a Persian family was controlling more. To govern things, they were including non-Arab Muslims, which was a weird thing in the beginning, because Arabs initially liked being Muslim, and they liked Arabs being Muslim. But other people, yeah. It was a very odd merging time when other people were becoming Muslims as well. But this is, they have an empire, so you have to let anyone who wants to be Muslim be Muslim. You can't, you can't exclude people for any, uh, unless it's a serious reason. But you had a lot of people coming together. They were cooperating. There's a big artistic upheaval. There's a lot of new things happening. A lot of science is taking place. A lot of research and literature and performances. And it did not last very long, because slowly, piece by piece, portions of it broke away and broke away and broke away, until it was pretty much like the area around Baghdad and then some extra stuff, and that was it. They couldn't uh, control everything convincingly. And they became very much uh, a very small country, which on paper looked very big, but which in reality just got respect from people, and that's all they got. And let's see what here, two. Yeah, okay. Ooh! Oh, there's Shadow Calus. Interesting. Now, I told you that to tell you this. Once it broke apart, it really broke apart. Uh, without the, the caliphs to dominate everything, a bunch of other people claimed themselves to be caliphs, to be sultans. A lot of the Turks were coming in. They were beys or atabeys. Uh, a lot of competition. But because of that, no one actually made a full country in the Middle East. They made 
20 countries in the Middle East and all the surrounding regions, or even more countries. And because they're so disunited, it makes it easy to use them against each other to free up space for yourself. Even if they're all Muslims, they're not all cooperating. They don't even necessarily like each other. Uh, most of them want to kill each other. So, even if they're Christian, they'll work with you because you are not their enemy. You're helping them fight their enemy. And it really doesn't matter to them as much. And that's basically what I'm looking at right here. I'm looking at how they came into the Middle East, how they set up their own states, and then what kind of interaction they had. And the Zen kids are a good example. You can see up here. They, they spread from northern Iraq all throughout Syria, down to modern-day Jordan. Not Israel, and the whole coastline here. The Crusader states were the exception. But they swept straight through down here. They were trying to push into uh, Egypt over in this section. They also got into Anatolia. Okay, so they got into Cilicia, a lot of the uh, northern Mesopotamian cities, but that was their border. potentate. Alright, so I could go after this in a number of ways, but I just thought I'd start here because they come up constantly with the Crusader states. So I'll start in here and then I'll move back and forth very easily. Right, so let's see. Put this in the 11s. Closer to this section. This is kind of like loosely organized based on time, but this will be more specific. The big of Mosul. That'd be northern Iraq. I want a quick uh, geography point. You can look at this very quickly. This bar. I can't use this one. Let's see. No, I can't use the other. Let's pick this. No, that's not good. And a lot of these aren't that good. Any more specific ones? No, those are the closest, really. Uh, is there any other ones I can use to show the difference? Ah, I just want to show the difference. Alright, let's do like this. So you have Syria and Iraq, which make up a lot of the core of the Middle East, or what's called the Middle East, because mostly they're very flat. They have deserts in the south. Uh, it's between them. In the south, between them, that's mostly desert. When you go to the east and the west of the countries, away from the center, less so. It's more, uh, you have the ability to farm. And it's more, it's easier to live there. When you have Baghdad here, you have Damascus here, North of Baghdad, in the upper portion, you have Mosul. North of Damascus, in the upper portion of Syria, you have Aleppo. And those four cities were very large, profitable cities that people always tried to control in the Middle East. And essentially, the Zengids and plenty of other people played hot potato with the cities. They would jump from city to city, lose city, get city, lose city, get city, and it goes back and forth like this constantly because they're trying to compete to grab these cities. And it's very difficult to hold on to some of them. Yeah. 
that. Alright. There's the Atabeg of Mosul. And if you need to know this, he's the Seljuk Atabeg. And the Seljuks were Turkish people who came into Iran. They ruled over a large empire for like two days, and then they didn't. But when they say Atabeg, they're referring to uh, Bey in Turkish, which means sir or chief, like a, a small tribal chief. But then Atabeg would be like the chief of a chief. In this case, I guess a regional kind of governor. And it's supposed to work for the Seljuks. A lot of them just said that, though. They, they really didn't. They made their own countries, essentially. They just ignored what the Seljuks wanted them to do. Yes, and his father was the governor, too. Let's see. Abu Sayyid Ak Sunkur al Hajib. Hajib. Hmm. Ooh, that sucks. He's the Seljuk governor of Aleppo. This is why I mentioned those cities. Actually, I should make a map for this too. That'd make it much easier. Okay, note to self. Make map. Okay. Cities. It's much easier to see if I just make a map of this stuff. He was doing that one. And you can see that it's Aleppo, that's northern Syria. He ruled most of Syria, but then following. Maybe treason? The rule of Damascus, southern Syria, had him executed in a very specific way. And this guy's name was Tutush, Abu Sayyid Taj ad Dawla Tutush the first, or just Tutush to make it easier. And he was the Seljuk Emir of Damascus. There we go. But they have different dynasties. What is this dynasty stuff? Okay, this is what I'm talking about. There's so many dynasties and competitors back and forth, I can't keep track of them. So, I need some kind of map, or an easy way at least, to understand the differences. It's kind of like putting puzzle pieces on top of each other. You just keep doing like overlapping, like Venn diagrams of who controlled what, who controlled where. Ugh. So he was the subject of the of Damascus. And all this does become important later. Aleppo and Damascus are right next to all the different crusader states. What happens in their countries affects the crusader states. You can't just discount their effect politically or geopolitically, given how close they were and if they wanted to invade or not. And it also comes up in the second part, too. They don't have neighbors on the coast of the Mediterranean. They have neighbors to the east, to the south, to the north, all over the place. These people are attacking them as well. So who are you going to fight? The little states that have the ocean, or the ocean, the uh, sea that you can use to get help? Or are you going to ally with people who could be overthrown tomorrow? Damascus. This is where the Mirdasids were. Now get ready for this dynasty stuff to come up. There are so many different dynasties which compete and then intercompete with each other. Arabon, control the of Aleppo, <laughs> more or less continuously. It's a few shaky years. Okay, there's another one. Oh my god. Let's see. Zengiz, he's in charge of Mosul in 1127. Draw the dates down too. So. Oh, I'll put this up here so you guys can see. The first crusade was. Uh, I should check this probably. The first crusade was 1099.
Yeah, there we go. Just 1099, right? Oh, it's a 1096. Why does it say 99? Wish. Oh, okay, so I'm, I'm mixing up the end with the beginning. Let's see. All right, this, there's also there's a mixing here which creates a little bit of an issue. Ironically, this picture on the right, this is Peter the Hermit. This has nothing to do with the First Crusade. This is the People's Crusade, which was a uh, grassroots campaign by the people of Europe to take back the Holy Land, and it failed miserably. It's not organized. They were just taking anybody. It was a mess, frankly. And that's why you see up here... At the Battle of Civitot. Hmm. Well, in this battle, they were easily annihilated. It did not take much. Because, again, they're very disorganized. And they probably did not have much cavalry. And the Turks were much better at cavalry, much more military, uh, militarily adept. A lot of these Turkish tribes would fight and fight and fight their whole history. And you have a bunch of people with sticks. Like, this is not good. None of this is good. This is very poorly planned. But they pegged the beginning to this date, which isn't... Uh, sometime in 1096, they peg it to that. But it's supposed to be in the middle of 1096. All right, so I'll put roughly 96 to 99. And look at it. It took me them years to march just after a few countries. So I'll put 96 to 1099. All right, something like this. The First Crusade was finished by 1099. All of this stuff is happening in the background. A lot of things are happening. Let's see, he was the chief Turkish potentate in northern Syria and Iraq. That's important, too, in these places. Yeah, I'll, the, I'll get the map. Let's put this up. There we go. You do not see behind the curtain. Do not hear behind the curtain. It is a mystery. Ooh. I will make a map for this in the future. It's much more helpful. Ta-da! Here you can see the Middle East. And this is why some of the divisions pop up in the way they do. Iran is very protected. They, except for the soft little underbelly, but very protected. They have the Zargos Mountains between them and everything else. It's a huge mountain chain. And it's fantastic, because in so many places, it's a mountain chain Next to mountain chains, next to mountain chains, next to hills, next to valleys, next to deserts. Uncrossable. Imagine an ancient army crossing this. This is a nightmare. You couldn't pay me to do this. So because of this giant mountain chain, you don't see, you really don't see Middle Eastern, uh, say Middle Eastern, Mesopotamian armies going into Iran. Like, controlling Iran from Mesopotamia, this part of Iraq, up to Syria, it, no, no, it, you don't see that. What you do see is Iran controlling them, because they have a good hidey hole when they have to maybe have revolts in this area. You just go back to Iran, okay, wait for it to clear up, we'll go back later. But you don't have that down here. They're well protected, Iraq and Syria are not. And this is why there's been so many different countries over the years. Without protection, you're kind of vulnerable and open to everything. And I put the terrain so you can see there's not really much terrain. And only some parts of this are a desert here. In this part of Iraq, west of Baghdad, this whole empty area down to the south, mostly a desert. But then you can see all along the Euphrates and the Tigris River, 
one go Tigers goes here, Euphrates goes here, they're coming back around, they connect, getting down here. There's lots of different lakes. They're very fertile around the rivers. You can irrigate the entire area. There's a large number of marshes and swamps because they overflow because it's so flat. There's nowhere for the water to go. It creates these big swamps. There's even people called marsh Arabs because they live in the marshes in the south. But that's just Baghdad. We come up here a little bit. Still more fertile areas down by the, uh, sorry, down next to the mountains. Of course, very fertile as well. They're uh, further from the desert. They don't have as many bad effects as they would be next to it. They have more rivers next to them. They have the more fertile regions around the mountains. So it's a bit easier to live there in some cases. All the way up in the north, and this is Mosul. Kind of funny because even though it's not a gigantic city, at least from the first glance, it, this is supposed to have over a million people living in here and the area around it. So it is a very large city. It just doesn't look that way. But then you go west, across northern Syria, to Aleppo, a very famous city as well. Thousands of years of history. Thousands. And this was a very large city as well. Ironically, in Syria, it's the biggest. When you go further south, you get to uh, Tomes. Where's the, okay, that's the one You get to Damascus over here, which is the current capital of Syria, and another very large city. But you can see right outside Damascus is nothing. And nothing. Because you hit the desert again. The north of Syria is more famous as a fertile region. You can grow a lot of food up here. And of course, the Euphrates River here was dammed to create this large lake, Lake Assad. And it's much more, uh, you have the ability to irrigate it more. And it does not have the ill effects of the desert being next to it. So there's a reason it's larger. It's more livable. Down here by Damascus, you're getting less livable. Over by the Jordan Valley, between Israel and Jordan, much more fertile. But Syria doesn't have that. Not really. And you can come down here. It has some okay regions. But then you hit the desert and you do not see much. Which is why when you talk about uh, the Crusades, Middle Eastern politics, Mesopotamia, any historical things in this region, it goes in a... Uh, what's this shape? It's not an L. Like a, a house shape. It goes Damascus to Aleppo, over to Mosul, down to Baghdad. So it's an empty square. There's a gap here in the south. And mainly that wasn't a problem because no one attacks from the south. Maybe you get some Arab tribes which live down there occasionally. That's not the big problem, though. And most of them lived further down. Uh, over here, you have Medina and Mecca and then Jeddah over here. But these are very famous cities, but they're very far south. And this is a very mountainous region. These areas have some mountainous regions, some volcanic regions, and lots of different desert regions, but some also nicer ones. There's a lot of variety in deserts. It's not all just sand. But trying to live here is very difficult. So you wouldn't have this problem in the south, but if you look to the west or the east or the north, and that's where the problems come in, because there's no, there's no good way to create a barrier between you. Turkey's got a good barrier, plenty of good mountains. Iran's got a barrier, plenty of good mountains. Egypt even in itself has a good barrier. Across the Sinai Peninsula, which is like a desert with tons of mountains. Then you gotta get to the Suez Canal. Not favorable for anybody. You don't want to do that. So all of them have nice good barriers, which makes it easy to form their own nations in these areas. Not the Middle East, which is why they get split up so often. And it's why in the politics of the region, you saw so many different states. That it's not, the land is not stable to create one single country. You're too open. In modern times, not much of an issue. But if you get invaded over and over again, you can't run to fortresses. Like You just have walled cities and farms, and that's it. You don't have good mountains to trap people in. You don't have very fertile regions to raise huge armies from. You just have enough, and hopefully you survive. Good luck.
Okay, there we go. We took Aleppo from the Artichids, another dynasty. There was a TV show years ago called Dynasty. I only remember it because people reference it from time to time. This is even more dramatic as Dynasty, because these people would fight constantly. They never stopped fighting each other. And the reason is not because they are naturally warlike. It's not for jihad. Specifically, it's not. They don't even care about it in some cases. The reason these people are fighting so much is because they're all different Turkish tribes. They all came over from Central Asia. They established their own kingdoms, their own states. But they did so by attacking other people. And then more tribes came in, and they attacked those, because there's no central government. They're all disorganized. So basically, it's a bunch of people just setting up different countries, attacking each other. And then more people come in, set up more countries, and they attack each other again. And it's a constant back and forth. There's no stable uh, middle thing to keep it all together. It's just a merry-go-round of fun and violence. Fun and violence. Over and over again. I'm trying to think when this ended, too. Because they kept squabbling internally, even with uh, Saladin, or uh, by his original name, Salah ad-Din. There, there was only limited stability. He came from Egypt. I can point this out to him. He came from Egypt, up to the Crusader states, Israel and Lebanon, Syria and Jordan. Came up, sucked up all this, went to Aleppo in northern Syria, went east, 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 took Mosul, and then kind of stopped. And that stabilized it for a little bit. But his state, it didn't fall apart, but it did shrink. And because it shrank, it didn't really fix these problems. And they kind of went back to fighting with each other again. However, Iran was also coming in trying to maintain some balance. But it only really became balanced, I think, and I need to be corrected, when Turkey came in, specifically the Ottomans. Because the Ottomans took over most of the Middle East, and they kept it as one con uh, contiguous country and they split it up into different uh, provinces, essentially. And by doing this, there's no one to fight each other anymore. There's still conflicts, but the local, not massive, uh, regional issues. So it seemed that you needed one state to unify everything together, to force them to get along, and to protect it from outsiders who constantly instigate against each other. I'm trying to think before... Even before this period, it was the Romans and the... Uh, Persians, and again, large states to control everything. Uh, there was a bunch of different states in the meantime that would again fight each other, but a bit less so because they were more established. Let's see, took from you. Our two kids. Two kids. 11 to win hit. And again, I'm using Wikipedia for this, but it'd be better if I had good sources I could also get this material from. I don't know. It's nice it's from a book, but I want to see where the source is from. And then took Odessa from the Crusaders. And this is the important part here. He managed to take the county of Odessa, which was one of the four cru uh, crusader states. It was the northernmost one. It was in uh, the Mesopotamian cities in the north, above Aleppo and Mosul. The problem with it, though, there are a bunch of small little countries. All the crusader states were a couple cities spread over a little bit of difference, a di difference, distance, and not much else. And with that problem, well, you better have good allies, or you better pray a lot. It doesn't work to have small countries here. You get overrun because you don't have defenses and you don't have allies to help you. There's no network that can push back against threats. And the Crusader states, well, they sometimes worked together and they sometimes hated each other. They also had dynastic internal issues. They were trying to control Jerusalem or inherit one state or inherit one lordship after another. And they couldn't do that either. Siege of Odessa, they sieged it. 
Okay, made him a hero in the Muslim world. <laughs> it made him a hero, and he was assassinated. Assassinated by a slave. Oh, well. Right. He was heroic. So, by controlling Mosul, Aleppo, and Edessa, that would make him a northern Mesopotamian uh, ruler. So, he had a lot of power in the north of Mesopotamia. And if you're confused by that one, Mesopotamia is supposed to be the Tigris and the Euphrates River. They merge here around Baghdad and go south over to the Gulf here. Uh, they kind of link near Basra above Kuwait in this little tiny section. They go straight out. But when they come up, they go from Baghdad to Mosul, up into Turkey, and they go from Iraq across into Syria, over again into Turkey, near Gaziantep. So they come from these mountains in northern Turkey, but it's not just there because rivers in the Zargos in Iran link to the, uh, to the Tigris River in the east. Generally, that's supposed to be Mesopotamia. It's the central parts of Iraq, Syria, up to northern, uh, the northern parts of the country, into Turkey. The west of Syria down to Lebanon and Israel is supposed to be the Levant. It's supposed to be a bit different, because it is different. They have, ocean, they have sea access. I keep saying ocean. They have sea access. Iraq doesn't have sea access. Look at this. There's no barrier. What kind of sea access is this? This is pathetic. Look at this. There's a beach. They have a beach, a mosque, and a town. Woo. That's their coast. So culturally, they're going to be different. That's why the Phoenicians were traders, and people in Iraq were land traders. There's a big difference between those two. You can do more on the sea. You have more access. It's easier to move. In fact, sea travel is faster than land travel at this point in time, hundreds of years ago just better. And you improve your society by doing this. And if you don't have access, well, you don't improve much. You improve more slowly. And here we go. He died and his territories were divided and everybody made peace. <laughs> I'm kidding. Mosul in Iraq went to... Ooh, Ghazi. Ghazi, Dessa went to Nur ad-Din, and he becomes important later too. Okay, let's see. So let's go to these two guys. Saif al-Din Ghazi. He inherited Mosul. And when you say Mosul, we're uh, talking about the city and a lot of the area around it, too. Remember, there are four key cities across the Middle East. When you inherit one, you get all the stuff around it. So effectively, you get a square. The city and everything around it, and lots of other stuff, too. If you can keep it. and Nur ad-Din got maybe the Sham province, but effectively that was this. Aleppo and Odessa. I if that was an equal trade or if it wasn't worth it. Well, Odessa was new, so probably not as economically viable. Hmm. Let's see. Oh, interesting. So Nur ad Din beat Raymond of Poitiers, the Prince of Antioch. And Antioch was another uh was that I think it's the, prin the Principality of Antioch, I think. Let's look here. Yeah, Principality. 
Yeah, there's so many different names because they're from different places. Uh, count is more common in France because they're all counts and they have counties. But some of the princes wanted to make principalities, which are kind of, the name is sort of like king in some cases. It gets used in Germany a lot. Uh, I don't know the, the big difference, but it was kind of used. I believe it comes from princeps, which was a Latin word that the Romans would use to refer to first citizens, like the leader of an area. So it comes from that. But then it also got used in like a monarchy's family, but not a ruler. Just you're going to be in Harry next or you're in the family. Let's see. Let's go. And this will be later Crusader history, but we can at least write it down now to keep track of it. Nur Adin. Raymond de Raymond de Poitiers. I have no idea how to pronounce the French, but I'm going to pretend that I'm doing an okay job. Or at the bare minimum, a minimally offensive job. There's at the baton. The knob. Baton. 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 In 1150, he conquers Odessa. Oh, I didn't see this part yet. Wow. He, cap he caps it off with taking Damascus. They lost Damascus. How embarrassing. I, I showed this on the map. Maybe it you might not have seen it properly. So from the map, it's pretty obvious. Mosul, flat city. It's not very high up. Baghdad's pretty similar. Baghdad, flat city. The point is that there's supposed to be cities on the river, and they control a lot of the trade and access to the river. That's the point. The problem is, unless you have a natural defense, it's just a city wall, whatever army you have. If the army sucks, well, it's going to suck. Now, Aleppo is a bit different. It is, a, it is built on a river, too. However, it's more hilly. You've got hills in here, so you, you can retreat to a place, at least. Is this the actual river or is it not the river? I thought it was built on a river. What's the... Does the river have a name? Which one is this? Show me the river's name. Why don't you show the river name? Whatever. So a bit hilly, not as much. Damascus is in a much better position. You have all these mountains back here, and you can retreat and go up the mountains, right up here. And you can fight from back here as well. And you can keep going and retreating, and you have natural defensive areas to fight from. So getting it taken means you probably did not do a good job in holding it. But it's not as fertile, uh, fertile as the other three. So it's not as sought after unless you want to control this region. In which case, you better take it. Oh, too far. Let's see. Or Nur Adin. Collectively embarrasses everybody else. Oh, he's doing much better than everybody else, too. He's doing fantastic. Is it Buri or Buritz? There we go. Now, if I'm remembering here, the Buritz are a Persian. Oh, they're not a Persian dynasty, it's a Turkish dynasty. They're thinking Buryid. Hmm. I think their names are kind of close to each other. Buryids. Oh well. Uh, 
I will point out this as well. You can see from the rulers' names how things change over time, how they become, the Turkish people are becoming more ingrained into a Muslim society. The first ruler's name, Zahir Uddin, sounds pretty, uh, maybe, is Zahir more Persian? I'm not sure. But it sounds like it's from the region. Then, Tok, Toktekin. That does not sound Arabic at all. If it is, it's not the most common one I've heard. But it does not really sound like that. Then Taj ul Mulk Buri. Okay, look closer. Shams ul Mulk is Ismail. Okay, much closer now. It actually sounds like, an, like a, a more Arabic name. But notice Ismail and Shams. I believe those are more Persian. So they're maintaining the Persian culture, which they mix with Turkish, and then the Islamic religion. But then we come down to Shihab ul Din Mahmud. Much more Arabic now. And then Jamal Uddin Muhammad. I mean, it's pure Muslim names now. So over time, things change quite a lot for them. And they merge into to the uh, cultures here. But when they come, it's very different. Okay, Burids. Uh, mm -hmm. So the Burid dynasty is not on this map. Why is it not on this map? Okay, fine. They roll over the Emirate of Damascus. Okay. <laughs> I want to say Emirate of Damascus. It's basically the city and then some stuff north and south. So it sweeps like that. So it's kind of like Damascus up and then down, like this whole section. Like, kind of like this. So the mountains of Damascus down here a little bit. Just down the border, touching. So very close, but not quite there yet. And notice this part. The first board uh, ruler, Togtekin, began as a servant of the Seljuk ruler of Damascus, Dukak. Following Dukak's death in 1104, he seized the city for himself. Hmm, interesting. Seizing things for yourself. That will prove to be a pattern. All right, I don't think I mentioned the uh, Seljuks enough. Notice here all the green. This is misleading. The Seljuks were originally Turks. They conquered Central Asia in Iran. Just put this up here. Okay, Iran. Parts of Central Asia into Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, parts of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Took that up. Went to Iran. Doo -doo -doo. Took that up too. And then that's when they emerged and started going everywhere. They went to Azerbaijan, Armenia, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, all over the place. Conquering constantly. I forget if they... Uh, they might have made an attempt on Egypt. But they, they didn't take Egypt. I don't think. What's on the map? What's on the map? Yeah, they didn't take Egypt. So they conquered all over the place. But then, as they were conquering, they were using other tribes to conquer areas, and the tribes held things for them, and they were supposed to be loyal. But then there was a bunch of internal wars, all the leaders fought each other, and the government effectively was just non-existent. So if you have a bunch of tribal leaders all over the place who are holding stuff for you, after a while they'll figure out you're not strong enough to stop them, so they'll make countries. And this was part of the reason the Middle East became so uh, unstable. Because when they just took over, they just started, they took over everything and then fell apart. And when things fall apart like that and everybody could be a new king, it's just warfare all over the place. You can't control it anymore. And it's why there's so much infighting. Every prince and Atabeg and Bey and warrior with a spear wants to be the next king. And they all think they're going to be king and only one or two people actually are. Going down this list here. And remember the Zengins. It's a Muslim dynasty. They say O's. Uh, let me see. The way you pronounce, I think you should pronounce this. I mean, they don't use G's in Turkish that much. It's going to be O's Turkic, which is, uh, let me make sure about that. 
it's Oz Turkic, which just means a part of Central Asia most of the Turkish tribes came from. It's not uh, actually a different group of people. Uh, let me see in Turkish what they have. It's sometimes different across languages. Yeah. So that, it looks like Oguz or Oghuz, which is ridiculous. In Turkish, it is pronounced Oz. O Uz. O U Z. The G is supposed to be silent. Or just Uz in that way, too. Alright, we'll head to Saladin, then we're going to take a break for today. Okay, he moved his seat to Damascus. From Damascus. Okay, and the Principality of Antioch was getting gobbled up, I assume, by him. He's in Damascus. Yeah, so he's taking up. Um, This is better. And this is funny here, too. In the 1160s, he was in a competition with the King of Jerusalem, not to take the city or the country, to control Fatimid. The, uh, the Fatimid Caliphate, which is basically Egypt. Because the Fatimid Caliphate, like all the other governments, has a period when it's doing well, it's very organized, very effective, but then, like now, or this, this point contemporaneously in history, they're falling to pieces because they're so internally disorganized, they fight each other, the royal court can't get along, their finances are terrible, their soldiers revolt against them constantly, that they become very weak internally. And other people try and take advantage of it. So you one of those good, uh, good cases where it's happening. Think about this. If Israel, or sorry, the kingdom of Jerusalem, they don't call it, they don't call it Israel, I don't think. Is it the kingdom of Jerusalem? Yeah, it should be the kingdom of Jerusalem. The Latin kingdom of Jerusalem. I think, yeah, it should be the kingdom of Jerusalem, I think. They're not going to call it Israel. It's not the name they want to use. Let's see here. Imagine if they took over Egypt, and Egypt became a Christian country, and it was reinforced, and it grew throughout that part. That would have seriously changed history, and multiple subsequent uh, crusades attempted to do that over and over and over again, and they failed badly. Let's see. So he had his gen his Kurdish general Shirku, which is very important. He prevented the Crusaders from controlling it. He defeated them, and he became the governor of Egypt.
And this is where Saladin comes from. Or, al Masir Salah al-Din Yusuf ibn Ayyub. That Ayyub part becomes more important later. And see, his name should be, I think his name is Salah. Yeah, it should be Salah. Because Ad-Din would be the family that he's descending from, Nur Ad-Din, I believe. And Al-Nasir is something different. Right. His name could just be Yusuf, I'm not sure. Yusuf, it could be. Yusuf ibn Ayyub. Ayyub would be his father, I think. But his name is also Salah Ad-Din, but that could be like, uh, oh, what is it again? Salah could be prayer, Ad-Din could be like your religious beliefs. So that could be a, a, a title, not a name, I'm not sure. I have to look at it, that's what I'm saying. We keep calling him a Salah right now, but it might be something different. Right, so his nephew. Became vizier. Not emperor, just a vizier. Here under Al Adid. I did that. <laughs> Becomes the governor of Egypt. And 69. Oh, interesting. So when Al Adid died, let's see how. He dies in 1171, and Saladin takes over Egypt. Now, when Saladin does this, um, it's no longer the Fatimid Caliphate. The Fatimid Caliphate basically ends. And it says it up here. He switched the allegiance to Baghdad's Abbasid Caliphate, which is kind of like, it's just a nice thing to do. It's a, it's a nice, like, here, I, I submit to the Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad. But, it's more accurate to say, you're just saying that he's a good person. Because you're not actually under, his, you don't have to follow whatever he says. You're not under any command. But, this might make him more political friends, so smarter to do. And he's a Sunni, not a Shia. There's a big difference between those two. And yeah, later he becomes Sultan, and Nur ad-Din dies. And then finally, he becomes custodian of the two holy mosques. Which means he owns Medina and Mecca. Which is very important. He can then use that to show that he's like the, the paramount figure in the Muslim world. It makes him much more powerful. He's not a sultan, so I don't know where the sultan title comes from. What happened to Ghazi? Oh. Only made it to 49. So, what happens to him after... Huh, interesting. So, Mosul was not in his control. It looks like Nur ad-Din was just happy being like a, a Levant ruler. He, he was fine in the west, but he didn't try to go east. At least not at first. Okay, there was a bunch of successors. They all ruled for Mosul. That, that's a... Uh, I'll just type in. Oh my god. But that's probably a different story. Right on the next. 
Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. And that'll do it for today. And just as a reminder, the the videos for the plants and the sea slugs, the new branches, they're going to be mostly the exploratory versions that you saw. Later, I'm going to try and make more concise summaries to be more specific about them. But that will be until the future when I can go through them more thoroughly. And you saw you saw those uh, new branches and the species of plants. It's going you know, to take a little bit of time before I can pick them apart. And the Israeli politics one will be coming in, I believe, soon. And I have even much more than that. So, until next time, bye-bye.